that's known today was researched and developed by Eunice Ingham around 1935. She's known throughout the world as the pioneer and developer of modern reflexology. Her original work, Stories the Feet Can Tell, was published in 1938 and was followed by her second book, Stories the Feet Have Told. These books are published in seven languages. Eunice Ingham was the first to teach others to do reflexology and she continued in her own professional practice and teaching to the age of 83. Dwight Byers is the nephew of the late Eunice Ingham. He serves as president of the International Institute of Reflexology and in 1983 authored Better Health with Foot Reflexology, which is published in many foreign languages. Dwight Byers is the creator of these impressive reflexology hand and foot wall charts. These beautiful color charts have become basic tools in the training of reflexology practitioners and in transmitting the theories and concepts of reflexology to patients, medical writers, and those who choose to investigate a natural, drug-free way to better health. Through the International Institute of Reflexology, Dwight Byers has carried the teachings of reflexology throughout the United States, Canada, England, Switzerland, Ireland, France, South Africa, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and the West Indies. Dwight Byers has taught nearly everyone who's gone on to write books on reflexology, and as a mentor of this science, he's contributed to the skills of tens of thousands of practitioners. Hello, I'm Dwight Byers. I'm pleased that you have taken this step to acquaint yourself with reflexology. You're in good company. Over the years, thousands of people have taken the time and interest to learn about reflexology. The special qualities of videotape now allow us to present the principles and the techniques of reflexology in a whole new way. With multiple views of the treatment positions and the opportunity for you to improve your own technique by reviewing various sections of the tape as often as you like and reviewing the entire tape as you work to perfect your technique. In reflexology, perfect practice makes perfect. Reflexology is a science that deals with the principle that there are reflex areas in the feet and hands which correspond to all the glands, organs, and parts of the body. Reflexology is a unique method of using your thumb and fingers on these reflex areas. Foot and hand reflexology includes, but is not limited to the following uses. Proper use of reflexology techniques has proven beneficial in relieving the stress and tension that has become the byproduct of a fast-paced space age lifestyle. Improving blood supply and promoting the unblocking of nerve impulses and in helping nature achieve homeostasis or balance. According to many experts, approximately 75% of today's diseases are attributable to stress and tension. Tension acts like a tourniquet around the body's system and can lead to serious health consequences. Reflexology is a complement, a partner to modern medicine, not a replacement for the physician. We as reflexologists never diagnose, prescribe, or claim a cure for specific medical conditions. Let me repeat, we never diagnose, prescribe, or claim a cure for a specific condition. Let's take a look now at the anatomical relationship of the feet to the body. To keep the body at a normal state of homeostasis, or balance, it's imperative that the blood and nerve supply to every organ and gland be at a maximum. Each organ and gland make a contribution to maintaining health and each receives its instructions from the most intricate of all networks, the nerves. There's a corresponding relationship between the areas of the feet and the organs and glands of the body. The link from the feet to the organs and glands is a series of imaginary longitudinal lines, each encompassing a zone. An organ or gland found in a specific zone will have its reflex in the corresponding zone of the foot. There are 10 lines or zones one for each toe in the case of foot reflexology, one for each finger in hand reflexology. Zone one is found in the midline of the body. Zones two, three, four, and then zone five out at the shoulders. These zones also go down the arms and legs. Each of these zones are also found in the feet, five zones on each foot. 
starting with zone 1 in the center or medial side. Next you'll find zones 2, 3, and 4, and then zone 5 at the small toes on the lateral side. Using the zone theory is important to the reflexologist because any abnormality in any part of the zone may affect anything within that zone. Note that we find all five zones in the great toes. The great toe represents the head. The small toes are the fine tuning for everything in the head. This diagram shows the body relations guidelines. The diaphragm solar plexus line is found just below the metatarsal heads or the ball of each foot. Note the area is delineated by darker color. The anatomical waistline is found by running your finger down the lateral edge of the foot. About halfway down, you will find a high spot caused by the fifth metatarsal bone. Draw an imaginary line from this high point across to the medial edge of the foot is the waistline guideline. The pelvic guideline is found by continuing down the foot on the medial side to the beginning of the heel where there is usually a noticeable color and texture change. The last guideline is the tendon, which is found by flexing the great toe back and forth and gently running your thumb or finger over the sole or plantar of the foot between the first and second toe. These 10 zones and four guidelines help us to be more accurate in locating the reflexes in the feet. With the use of the anatomy charts and foot charts, we'll look now at the similarity of the anatomy to the reflex areas on the foot and you will see how our feet truly are the mirror of our body. We'll start with the organs, glands, and parts of the head. We find the brain in the upper portion of the head. On the foot, we find the brain on the tip of both great toes. The pituitary gland is found at the base of the brain, with the reflex found in the center of each great toe. Eyes and ears are in the center one-third of the head, and the eye and ear reflexes are found at the base and shafts of the small toes, with the shaft of these toes being helper areas for the eyes and ears, mainly the second and third toes. The sinus reflex is on the balls and shafts of all the toes. The reflexes for the teeth are found in the shafts of the toes. The throat, thyroid, and parathyroid glands are found at the base of the great toes. The side of the neck muscles are on the lateral side of the great toes. And the cervical vertebrae are found on the medial edge of the great toes. In the thoracic area between the base of the neck and the diaphragm, we find the lungs, breast, heart, and shoulders, the bronchial tubes, ribs, and back muscles. Let's examine the thoracic area between the base of the neck and the diaphragm. On the foot, you'll find the lung and breast area across the whole ball of the feet. The heart will be mostly on the left foot. The shoulder and arm reflex will be in and around the small toe joints. These reflexes will also be found on the top of the foot in the same area. You'll find the thoracic vertebrae on the medial edge of both feet. The reflex for the esophagus is located on the left foot. Now we'll examine the abdominal area between the diaphragm and the anatomical waistline. The diaphragm is the thin muscle that forms the floor of the chest. The diaphragm solar plexus is found just below the ball on each foot. On the right foot, we find the liver reflex. The gallbladder, which is embedded in the liver, is found in approximately the fourth zone in the liver area. The adrenal glands are found on both feet, on the medial side of the tendon, halfway between the diaphragm and the waistline guidelines. The kidneys are in the center of both feet, above and below the waistline guideline. On the left foot, we find the spleen in the fourth and fifth zones, and the stomach over most of this area. As we look at the anatomy chart again, we see that the esophagus comes through the diaphragm into the stomach on the left side. The pancreas is mostly on the left foot, with a small portion on the right, 
slightly below the waistline guideline. The duodenum is on the right foot. We also have the rest of the thoracic vertebrae on the medial edge. Now we'll look at the anatomical waistline to the pelvic guideline. We find the bottom half of the kidneys below the waistline guideline in the center of each foot. The ureters are on the medial side of the tendon from the waistline to the pelvic guideline. The bladder is found on the medial edge of both feet at the pelvic guideline. The small intestines are in the center of both feet with the large colon encompassed around the small intestines. Where the small intestine empties into the large colon is the ileocecal valve, which is found on the outer edge of the foot, about halfway between the pelvic line and the waistline on the right foot. And just below this is the appendix. Following up on the outside edge is the ascending colon. The bend is the hepatic flexure. The transverse colon goes across at the waistline. On the left foot, we find the other half of the transverse colon, the splenic flexure, and then the descending colon. On the medial edge of both feet will be the lumbar spine reflexes. Now moving to the pelvic area and below, the lower half of the bladder is below the pelvic guideline on the medial edge of both feet. On the left foot is the sigmoid flexure and sigmoid colon. Also in this area, on the medial edge of both feet, we find the sacrum and coccyx reflex. One of the reflexes for the sciatic is across the heel on both feet. The other is found on the lateral side, underneath the ankle bone. This area is also for the hip and back. The hip-knee-leg reflex is found forward of the ankle bone. The pelvic reflex area encompasses this whole area. Also on the lateral side, you'll find the ovary and testicle reflex halfway between the ankle and the back of the heel. The groin, lymph, fallopian tube reflex is found where the ankle is joined onto the foot. On the medial side of the back of the leg, we find the prostate, uterus, rectum, sciatic reflexes if chronic. And we'll find the uterus prostate reflex halfway between the ankle and the back of the heel. There are two interesting concepts that we use in doing reflexology. These are referral areas and helper areas. A referral area is an anatomically related area which can be worked instead of or in addition to the afflicted area. To achieve the anatomical relationship of the arm to the leg, note that the palm of the hand is facing forward or supine. The arm will bend in the opposite direction from the leg. The palm of my hand corresponds to the referral area of the bottom of my foot. The wrist serves as a referral area for my ankle. The inner forearm is a referral area for the calf of my leg. The back of my arm would serve as a referral area for the shin bone. The elbow would serve as my kneecap the front of the elbow to the back of my knee, and the upper arm to the thigh, and the shoulder to the hip. If there is a severe injury, let's say for instance a broken leg, you simply select the corresponding referral area on the arm and work that area in order to help the circulation in the injured area. If I had broken my leg halfway from the knee to the ankle, then I would work halfway from my elbow to my wrist. Let's talk a bit about the helper areas now. Just as the name implies, these are areas which when worked help in relieving tension or congestion associated with the afflicted area. The helper areas are reflexes that may have a direct effect on the afflicted area and are reinforcements needed to make sure you reach the desired results in treatments. For example, for a headache, you would reflex the neck, the cervicals, and the sacral coccyx reflexes, as the cause of the headache may be coming from these areas. The headache is telling us there is something wrong somewhere in the body. 
Let's take a look now at the start of an actual reflex session, concentrating particularly on the relaxation techniques. This is the proper position for the practitioner and the client. Note that the client is in a relaxed position and his head elevated so the practitioner can observe his facial expressions. A reclining chair is ideal. The chair for the practitioner is a typical secretarial type chair which is adjustable and has wheels that give the practitioner freedom to move around to achieve the best position for the reflex treatments. I'm going to go ahead with the session now and our narrator will explain what you are seeing as we go along. Before beginning, make sure your nails are short and if your hands or the client's feet are perspiring, use powder, cornstarch, or corn flour to take care of that problem. We do not use any oil or cream. And now we're ready to meet the feet. Always check for corns, calluses, ingrown toenails, or other problems which might cause discomfort through direct contact. We always begin reflexing the feet with a series of relaxing techniques to put the client at ease and to get the person's feet accustomed to your hands. Let's start now by demonstrating the back and forth relaxation technique. Place the palms of your hands on the edge of the metatarsal padding. Put one palm on the inside and the other on the outside edge. With your fingers relaxed, move your hands rapidly back and forth, opposing each other. Make sure your hands don't slip. That would cause friction and burn the skin on the foot. If your fingers are relaxed, the ones on the outside of the foot should slap the foot as the foot moves from side to side. See what we mean? Our second relaxing technique is the metatarsal kneading. The metatarsal kneading technique is accomplished by wrapping the right hand around the top of the right foot, just below the toes. Take the left hand and make a fist. Place the fist flatly against the bottom of the foot, directly opposite the top hand. Push with the fist, then squeeze with the top hand, using a kneading motion. Don't release all the pressure of the pushing fist, and don't let the fingers lose contact with the top of the foot. Remember, push and knead with rhythm. It's best to use the left fist on the right foot, and the right fist on the left foot. This puts your arm in a straight line with the leg. Now let's take a look at the spinal twist relaxation technique. When this is done properly, it feels marvelous. First, it's necessary to turn your body to the side and back up so your arms are extended. The foot should be tipped out, like so. On the right foot, you'll wrap your right hand around the foot with the webbing between the thumb and the fingers on the spinal reflex and the thumb on the bottom. Move the hand as far back toward the ankle as you can reach. The left hand should be up tight with the right hand so that the index fingers touch. Both thumbs should be flat on the bottom of the foot. The next step is to hold the right hand still and rotate the left hand. First one way slowly and smoothly and then the other way. After several rotations, move both hands together toward the toes. Continue the rotations gradually inching up until the left hand reaches the great toe. It's important to always work from the ankle to the toes. For the left foot, use the alternate hand with the same technique. Now let's take a look at the ankle loosening technique. Place the heel of your hands underneath the ankle bone, one on the inside and one on the outside. Your fingers should be relaxed on the leg. Hold your hands firmly against the foot so as not to cause friction. Now, rapidly move your hands back and forth, not up and down. The foot will shake from side to side. Notice that the hands move in opposite directions from each other. Next is the ankle rotation under technique. 
you will need to move to the left in order to have the rotating hand in line with the leg. Rest the heel of the right foot in the palm of the left hand. Gently hold the middle finger of the left hand on the uterus prostate reflex with the thumb wrapped around the outside part of the ankle where the leg is joined onto the foot. Make sure your whole hand is in contact with the foot in the groin reflex area. Now place the heel of the right hand on the metatarsal area with the fingers gently around the top of the foot. Rotate the foot back and forth in a slight oval motion. First one direction, then in the other, while controlling the pressure on the middle finger. Make sure when you're doing rotations that the push is greater at the little toe side. To work the left foot, use alternate hands. For the ankle rotation over technique, place the right hand with the fingers kept together over the top of the right foot. The webbing between the thumb and fingers will be over the ankle in the groin reflex area. Keeping the hand firmly wrapped around the ankle, but not squeezing, rotate the foot several times in one direction, and then the other. The left hand will do the rotation, pushing on the metatarsals. Make sure the rotating hand is in line with the leg. You may also change hands and rotate with the right hand. When we finish reflexing the toes, we can use the toe rotation technique. With the thumb and fingers of your left hand, firmly hold the joint of the right great toe. Place your right thumb on the bottom and the first two fingers on the top of the great toe all the way to its base. With a slight lift, rotate the toe first in one direction, then the other. Work all the toes in this manner. You'll find it easier to use your predominant hand for rotation on both feet. The diaphragm tension relaxer technique is extremely effective for a tense person or people with high blood pressure. We work the whole diaphragm reflex area, starting at the inside edge of the foot below the metatarsals. Place the right thumb on the diaphragm reflex with a slight angle up under the metatarsal heads. With the holding hand, grasp the base of the toes. Lift up and slightly back while putting extra pressure on the thumb in the metatarsals. Pull slightly forward and then let the lifting hand relax. Do this several times and then move the thumb over just a fraction. Continue with this action until you reach the lateral side. Repeat this process several times. The diaphragm deep breathing technique is reserved for the finale. Place the ball of your thumbs in the center of the diaphragm solar plexus reflex on both feet at the same time. Let the fingers lay comfortably on the top of the foot. Ask your client to take a deep breath and hold it each time you press on this reflex. As you push in on the reflex, they take a deep breath and hold it. As you slowly release half the pressure, they slowly exhale. Do this four or five times, never releasing all the pressure. Have the person hold his or her breath a little longer each time. Then, on the last time, ask them to blow all the air out. Remember, the secret is never to release all the pressure on the bottom until you're all finished. It helps to breathe with the person so you don't make them hyperventilate. Now here's a special technique for a client who has edema or swelling in the lower extremities. Use all your fingers together to walk the fluid up and out. Keeping the foot back and straight, use firm pressure with both thumbs on the bottom of the foot for leverage. Walk all of your fingers slowly and methodically up on the top of the foot toward the ankle like this. Repeat several times. Now let's look at some examples of how to use the relaxation techniques in the course of an actual reflexology treatment. When you finish working in the metatarsal area, you'll want to use the metatarsal kneading technique. After reflexing the spine, an excellent choice of relaxation technique is the spinal twist. 
The diaphragm tension relaxer technique is particularly useful in the beginning of a treatment to help reduce tension, and then again at the end of the treatment to leave the client in a comfortable relaxed state. We're sure you have found this presentation on the background of reflexology and on relaxation techniques to be helpful. This video should be used only as a review of the techniques taught at our International Institute of Reflexology seminars, and in blood supply in promoting the unblocking of nerve impulses and in helping nature achieve homeostasis or balance. According to many experts, at the proper height. Now for the practitioner, we're in a secretarial chair which moves from side to side and also turns, which makes it a lot easier to reach the reflexes. Also, it's adjustable for my legs and my back for support. Now, before we start the session, we want to be sure that our nails are nice and short. We want to be sure that if our hands perspire or the feet perspire, we use some powder, cornstarch, or corn flour. Now I'm going to start the session, and our narrator will explain to you what you are seeing. Let's meet the feet. Always check for corns, calluses, ingrown toenails, or any other problems which might cause discomfort through direct contact. Every reflexology session should begin with a series of relaxation techniques. These are designed to put the client at ease and to get their feet accustomed to your hands. Various relaxation techniques are covered in the textbook and in video one in the Institute's video training series. Remember to intersperse relaxation techniques with the treatment techniques appropriate for the area being worked on. This helps in keeping the client relaxed and provides a rest for the practitioner's hands as well. Most of the techniques will be shown with the demonstration using only the right foot, although of course when you're in a treatment session you'll be using the techniques on both feet. Remember also that while in this program we will be making only one pass over each area, in an actual treatment session, you should be making two or three passes. Let's begin with learning how to properly hold the foot with the hand that is not doing the work. Place the heel of the holding hand against the metatarsals of the foot with your fingers around the top of the foot and the thumb lightly against the great toe. This gives you control of the foot. Note how the reflexes are brought out to the surface as you push the foot back. Let's start off with a demonstration of the basic thumb technique on the right foot. You'll be using the medial side, or inside, of the thumb. If you use the lateral side of your thumb, you'll be putting a lot of strain on the thumb joints, and your hands will become very tired. Place your working hand on the foot with the thumb on the bottom and the fingers on the top of the foot for leverage. Remember, the leverage with the fingers should have firm pressure, as the fingers on the top are what give the strength to the thumb on the bottom. Next, practice walking your thumb using the medial corner on the bottom of the foot. Keep a constant forward pressure on the thumb as you slowly bend and unbend the first joint of the thumb. Remember, constant steady pressure and good leverage. See how smooth the motion is? Now let's move to working the metatarsal area of the foot. Make sure your holding hand is pushing the foot back and out and that the thumb is spreading the great toe to open the groove between the phalanges or toes. Now, lift the elbow of the working hand to help you work around the whole great toe joint. Starting at the base of the great toe on the medial edge, walk across this area to the groove. 